The aim of this video is just to go over some of those important diagrams that you might encounter when you're studying or being examined on plant reproduction. The first diagram that we encounter in this topic is always the structure of the flower. It's so important that you can label all the details of the flower, be able to identify all the specific parts of the carpal and the stamen. But often we get stuck or we get comfortable with one diagram in particular. And it's so important to do exam papers because when you do exam papers, you get exposed to alternative diagrams. And it's really important to try these. One version of the flower that often comes up is this diagram. However, it's usually not coloured. This particular diagram has appeared at least twice at ordinary level in the exams. So even if you get a different diagram, you should be able to pick out or identify the key parts of the flower. So let's start with the female part of the flower, the carpal. So this is one carpal, but you can see on the flower that there are many, and it's important that you can pick out the key parts of the carpal. When we look in detail at this flower, we can look at one individual carpal and identify the stigma, the style and the ovary. So when you look at the rest of the diagram again, it's easy to pick out the stamens made up of the anther and the filament. Then go on to the rest of the flower, those green structures, the sepals that protect the flower when it's in bud. Then you have the receptacle down through the middle of the flower, the petals, which in this case are brightly coloured to attract pollinators, insects such as bees. And some flowers have nectaries. These produce a sugary substance and this attracts pollinators, insects. So if you encountered something like this in your exam in June, could you label this particular flower? Well, A is pointing to the petal, B is to the anther of the stamen, C is to the filament of the stamen, D is the receptacle, E is a sepal, and F is pointing to a carpal, but specifically the ovary of the carpal. And as we've looked at the carpal of the flower, let's try this diagram. So let's start labeling from the top. This is the stigma. Then we have the ovary. The next label is the embryo sac. Then we have those two polar nuclei. And then we have the integuments, which are the walls of the ovule. So with the seed diagrams, it's exactly the same case. There are key labels that you have to be able to identify or to draw in on your own diagram. So the plumule, the radical, the cotyledon, the endosperm, and also the testa, the outer coating of the seed are important. So if we start with the broad bean seed on the left, this diagram is very common. It is a dicot, so it has two cotyledons, but only one is visible in this diagram. And it has no endosperm at maturity, so the broad bean is non-endospermic. The maize seed on the right is is a monocot. It only has one cotyledon and it does have an endosperm present, so it's endospermic. So adding the key labels into these diagrams, we start off with the plumule. This will form the shoots, the radicals. These will form the roots. Then in the broad bean seed, there are two cotyledons, but only one is visible in this diagram. And then in the monocot, the maize seed, there's only one cotyledon and the rest of the seed is taken up by the endosperm. So when we're looking at seed diagrams, and here are two different versions of a monocot seed diagram, we're looking for those key labels. We're looking for cotyledons, one cotyledon in the case of monocots, then the plumule, which becomes the shoots, the radical, which will form the roots, and most monocots are endospermic. And not forgetting the testa, the outer coating of the seed. With dicot seeds, you're looking for all the same labels. The only difference are the two cotyledons. Dicots always have two cotyledons. Dicot seeds are mostly non-endospermic. They do not have an endosperm at maturity, for example, the broad bean seed. But there are exceptions, for example, the castor bean seed. It does have an endosperm at maturity. You could be given a different view of the diagram that you're used to. For example, this is the broad bean seed and it's been cut in half and opened up. So make sure you can add in those key labels to this diagram also. You should also be able to label the epicotyl, which is the region just below the plumule, and the hypocotyl, the region just above the radical. Where is food stored in seeds? It's important to know. There are two places, either in the cotyledons or in the endosperm. As most dicot seeds are non-endospermic, the food is stored in the cotyledons, as is the case of the broad bean seed. In monocot seeds, it's more usual for food to be stored in the endosperm. It's rarely stored in the cotyledon. A short question that could appear is what is the function of the fruit? Well, firstly, you know that the fruit forms when the ovary swells after fertilization and the function of the fruit is to protect the seed and to aid with its dispersal. Another important detail to remember is that the ovary wall becomes the pericarp. The pericarp is the wall of the fruit. So you could be asked, what is the pericarp? 
Fruits can be classified either as true fruits or false fruits. True fruits are formed from the ovary of the flower which swells after fertilisation, whereas false fruits form from other parts of the flower. For example, in the case of the apple, the ovary of the flower is deep within or surrounded by the receptacle and it's the receptacle that swells as well as the ovary after fertilisation and it's the receptacle that forms the fleshy tissue that you're eating. A question that's often asked in a short question is how would you produce seedless fruits? This is known as parthenocarpi. One way of producing seedless fruits is to spray the flowers with growth regulators, for example, auxins. The differences between wind and animal pollinated plants is often examined. Let's look at grasses, which are wind pollinated. They would have feathery stigmas, long stamens. All of these reproductive parts would hang on the outside of the flower. There's no bright petals, no perfume, and these plants produce lots of light, smooth pollen. Animal pollinated plants, these generally have brightly coloured flowers with the reproductive parts inside the flower. They often have nice perfumes, they have nectaries that produce nectar, and they produce rough pollen grains. So this video covered some of those key questions that you often overlook, which could appear on your exam paper this year. So remember that these videos do not replace using your textbook or listening to your teacher's guidance. The very best of luck.